أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنعتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا بالقاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائه المجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقلة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جرنا وجركم المسابين أبي أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Being the night of Hazrat Abba, salamu alayhi, we will spend some time uh, extensively talking about Hazrat Abba and a uh, little bit of what we know we will inshallah share. So just be prepared for that. As far as our topic is concerned, we come to the next leg of our topic in appreciation of how we ought to be right now with the lofty objective that we have of creation of a beautiful world that we look forward to by examining the principles of existence and examining existence at large and through that examining the human condition and through that arriving at this judgment as to how we ought to be at present by seeing how existence is. One of the facets, undeniable facets of existence we discussed motion and evolution. Another facet of existence that is undeniable is what we call the individuality of existence. What do we mean by individuality of existence without making it very cumbersome and tired for the brain, tiring for the brain? Individuality of existence means that if you look anywhere within the world of God, we don't find anything that is universal. Of course, we have universal, universality and in uniformity, and we will come to that. But we find individual entities in the world of God. There is concrete individuality. <coughs> no two people look the same. Even if two people were to be produced, <coughs> genetically engineered, in the very first millionth of a second, as soon as they arrive in this world, they will begin their individual journeys. The very fact that one is sitting here and the other one is sitting here, that slight difference of angle of that light falling on their faces will start marking their individuality and their differences. Take anything in the world of God. There are no two things that are identical. Identity is with individuality. Look at the billions of blades of grass adorning a lawn. None of them are the same. They look the same to us, naively, but the very fact that their locations are different shows that they are different. There is nothing but individuality. Look at our faces. They are different. Look at our voices. They are different. Our mannerism, our gesticulation, the way in which we think, the way in which we react, the way in which we behave. There is, no sim there is similarity, but there is no identity beyond the individual. The individual is the truest thing that we find in the world of God. There is nothing but individuality. Now, if we were to ask ourselves that this, how, how much, is, uh, what is this? We would say this is one, and this, we would say this is one, and together they are two. This is wrong. Two is not there in the real world. There is nothing but one and one. If you were to ask a child, the child would find the abstract notion of two very difficult because two actually in the concrete world, in the realist sense, does not exist. It is no more than one and one and one and one and one. The world of God is full of just one. There is nothing but individuality. Nothing but individuality. And this 
is something that needs to be understood. And from here, we can arrive at certain gems of thought, human thought, and can resolve a lot of problems that are in our minds. This individuality brings in a notion of relativity and plurality. These are the notions that are the binding notions of human existence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors this individuality. God is not the God of one as opposed to the God of other. He is not more your God and less my God. He is equally the God of all at everybody's level. Imam Sadiq Salamullah states that an ant feels its Lord has two antennas because the ant cannot presume of anything beyond itself. Similarly, the human being, me and you, are the greatest creation of Allah on the face of this earth and there can be nothing greater than us. It's impossible. Think about it carefully. The very fact that me and you say I am and we validate every notion in our minds shows that we are the absolute authorities. Even if a superior alien race were to come onto, fa onto the face of this earth, the very fact that I can gauge them theoretically shows I become as great as they are. There can't be anything greater than me because my world is my world. All of you here right now that are there, for me, you are parts of my world. I am your author. You are in a way in which I want you to be. I receive you in the way that I receive you through my sense perception. I think about you in the way that I think about you. It's wholly my world. You're all contingent to me. Similarly, I am a part of your world. It is my individualistic world. It is your world. It is our world. However, each one of us is in a very different world to anybody else. My God is my God. Your God is your God. Is it any surprise that Ibn Abi Talib in his Dua'i Qumayl Salamullah Alayhi says, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. It cannot be anything but my Lord. Have you not heard the Prophet say, that Abu Dhar is on the ninth level of faith. Salman is on the tenth level of faith. Iranians normally feel very happy about this. And if Abu Dhar were to know what is in the heart of Salman, Abu Dhar would deem Salman as a kafir. And Abu Dhar would make the spilling of the blood of Salman lawful because Abu Dhar cannot understand the God Salman is worshipping. God of Salman is Salman's God. The God of Abu Dhar is Abu Dhar's God. Both of them are in their individual worlds. How amazing is this? We need to open our minds to this thing. So if you allow me, I'll explain a bit more, elaborate on it a bit more, before we come to draw concrete philosophical uh, conclusions from it. Nobody worships the same God. Nobody lives in the same world. Nobody has the same value. Nobody is the same. It's a world of individuality. Imagine, we are all worshipping a different God. It's not the same God we worship. And that's why we say often, break the greatest idol in the name of Allah. For He is the greatest idol. My goodness. That is no Allah we are worshipping. We have constructed something in the name of God. That needs to be crushed because that's nothing more and nothing less but the fanciful thinking of Arif projected at the level of God. And that is what he worships. If he were to look deep into himself, he is not doing anything but worshipping his own self. However, through submission, we begin to worship Allah gradually. In any case, it is a world of individuality and Allah honors this world. Ibn Arabi, the great mystic, was sitting in a place at one point and he said to the congregation, your God is beneath my feet. <coughs> As was expected, they stoned him and chased him away. Then somebody said that Ibn Arabi is no ordinary man. He must have meant something. Let us go and see. So they dug at the place where he sat and they retrieved a treasure trove. And he said, ah, this is what Ibn Arabi meant, that you are worshipping <coughs> gold and silver and your God is beneath my feet. 
Nobody is in the same world as anybody else here right now. Everybody is different. There is an absolute law of individuality. Now, I want you to just for a moment tell me if there is anything more than an individual, the world that is filled with anything other than individuality. Moon is one, sun is one, earth is one, you are one, I am one. Name me anything that is more than one in its identity. There is nothing. Everything is an individual. Now, God honors this individuality. I was looking at this uh, particular program on Google, and it's an amazing program. I don't know if you've heard it uh, from me on internet, if somebody's been following the lectures. But it shows the whole earth, and it depicts the rate of birth and death. And you see in front of you a map, and there are gray dots and white dots popping up everywhere on that map at a phenomenal speed. The gray dots are deaths, the white dots are births. And within an hour you're seeing hundreds of thousands of gray dots and white dots. Now at that point I was prompted to think, my goodness, we are just statistics. We take birth and we die, we take birth and we die, it's as ordinary as that. Insects come and insects go. Plant life comes into existence and it goes. Human life is no different. How amazing is this? We are just taking birth and we are going, we are taking birth and we are dying. The only thing was that the rate of birth was twice, almost twice as much as the rate of death. But now this prompts us to think, what is the value of human life, therefore, in the grand scheme of things? Does human life actually mean anything? Seven billion people on the face of this earth, that's a colossal number. They are dying and renewing, dying and renewing themselves all the time and increasing in numbers. And then you think about the great universe. Forget about great being in existence, just the physical universe in which we are. The latest theory is that it is both infinite and expanding. It baffles the mind. These sort of notions cannot be grasped by the mind infinity and expansion at the same time. Expanding in what? The mind can't grasp these notions. Yes, We are so bound by time and space. You think of only this five-dimensional universe and you think of the earth in there which cannot even be located. You know, me and you, we don't know where we are right now. Are we right to something, left to something? We are lost in space. How strange is the story of man. He opens his eyes without even knowing his history. Amazing. And we spend all of our lives trying to find out where we are, who we are, where are we from, what stellar dust has constructed us. It's truly baffling if you look at it, at, at it from that scale. Now, here comes a thought that what is the worth of human life anyway? People are taking birth and people are dying and that too on a planet that is not to be located in the Milky Way, let alone the physical five-dimensional universe. And then you think, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, if there is a God, then imagine what He has created. Of course, there is a God, yes? Don't take me wrong, but I'm talking about it as a philosopher. If there is a God, imagine what He has created. Unending worlds, and on one such world, which is totally unrepresented on the map of the universe, there are seven billion people that are little lights popping up and uh, switching on and switching off. God truly should not have time for any of these things. He should not be concerned with human life, who takes birth and who dies. Imagine if you are the architect of such a vast universe and in that universe at some point which cannot be located, which is so insignificant, which is so insignificant, the earth, earth is not even a speck of dust compared to those massive stars that are out there. Do you know that? If the sun was the size of an orange, the earth would be a dot on it. And that sun is less than a dot compared to the stars that are out there. So in this great design, the great architect has made such wonders 
there is something that is not even a dot. And on that something which is not even a dot, there are 7 billion people who are popping up and going off. He, by priority, should not have any time for any of these people. Let alone their, their fights of who should pray this way, who should pray this way. Imagine. He should not have time for this earth. By priority, he should not have time for the inhabitants of earth. By priority, he should not care less about who is praying this way, who is praying this way. That's what I thought to myself. I said, my God, should God have any time for any of this nonsense? And then I thought, look at him. SubhanAllah. Say to my slaves, I am indeed near. I respond to every supplicant. And then, وَقَالَ رَبِّ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ your Lord says, call on to me, I will respond to you. He is that Lord, that I am nothing among seven billion people. I say, oh Lord, and he comes running to me as if he has no time for anybody else. It's just me. It's all about you, he says to me. He says, oh my creature, it's all about you. I have all the time in this world, in this universe for you. It's your story. It's all about you. There is nothing beyond you. I am yours, fully yours. This is how individuality is working. Everything is an individual. And in that individuality, the whole world is for that individual. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors that individual fully. This is how he has structured our world. Now, let's go on to its explanation because it's, it's a phenomenal principle. Look at these prophets of Allah. Ibrahim was Khalil. Musa was Karim. Isa was Ruh. Rasulullah was Habib. Adam was Safi. All of these designations shows what? Their unique personalities. Their unique stature. Their unique understanding of God. Their individuality. Look at the Imams. Every Imam is different. There is Mujtaba, there is Shaheed, there is Zain al-Abideen, there is Baqir, there is Sadiq, so on and so forth. They are all individuals. They are all very, very different from each other. Each one of them depicting their own individual beauty and their own connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is honoring all of them. It is nothing but the naivety of the human mind when we say that the prophets are all the same. Yes. La nufarriqu bayna ahadin min rusuli. Allah is saying that. That's a uniformity which we want to come to. But what does he say? Tilka rusul faqdalna ba'aduhum ala ba'ad. Those prophets who have given precedence to some over others. Doesn't he say that? He is talking about their distinctions that are there. Similarly, Allah says in surah after surah, do you not see how we send the rains upon the earth? It goes into valleys and from it you find different produces. Is the same life-giving substance, but what it produces are individuals that are distinct and that are different from each other. Now here the naivety that we have in our minds, and I'm going to bring in that hadith to show how naivety prevails upon our minds, yes? We have that hadith, Awwaluna Muhammad, Akhiruna Muhammad, Awsatuna Muhammad, Kuluna Muhammad. Our first is Muhammad, our last is Muhammad, our middle is Muhammad, and all of our Muhammad, which is a true hadith. However, the way we understand with our naivety means that all of them are the same in their personality. It's impossible. They can never be. They are all depicting a very different facet of the truth in their own capacities. Al-Hasan and Hussein, if you compare them in the life in which Hussein lived under Imam Hassan, you will find Imam Hussein's personality is totally different from the personality of Imam Hassan. It's totally different. No two individuals are the same. They are all very, very different, and all of them are equally Imams. All prophets are different. They are equally prophets, but Allah honors all of them equally. If we have understood that, then we can say that this individuality naturally produces what we call relativity and plurality. We want to go to plurality in maybe sometime 
When we talk about relativity, when we talk about relativity, what we mean is that every individual it is, is at a very different level of their own existence and appreciation of the truth. The fact is that Allah honors it. Allah honors the truth of the individual at the level of the individual. What that means is that the ideal community is not a community in which everybody is the same. It's an impossibility. You will never have it. If that was the case, we would not have the uh, Jawad Bhai before me trying to convince us of his case. If we were all the same, there would be no need for him to convince us. If that was the case, you would not need me to try and arduously, laboriously trying to explain my own perspective of life. We would all be thinking the same way. We are not. We are thinking very, very differently because we are all products of different environments, different DNA, different location that has brought that individuality in our psychological being as well as our physical being. Our physical beings are individual. Our psychological beings are different as well. Our intellectual beings are different as well. Our emotional beings are different as well. The secret is to try and understand relativity and to say that relativity is the absolute truth of the face. Uh, of God and of creation. If we can understand that, then the question is one of appreciating this variety. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created variety. It is only a foolish mind that talks of unity of God at the exclusion of variety. The unity of God is to be seen in this variety and multiplicity that is constituted by individuality. There is no such thing as the unity of God beyond variety and multiplicity. We are all very, very different as human beings, yet we are united under the banner of humanity, aren't we? That's the binding force that unites us. If we can understand variety, then that solves so many problems within the mind of the Muslim and allows the Muslims to open his arms up to the truth and arrive at the true notion of what Mahdiism is and how we ought to exist right now. The claims that we have in Islam of exclusivism is totally unfounded. <coughs> this is wrong. That we are the only people who will attain salvation. Why did God create variety in that case? Why is variety and individuality the absolute norm? And when we say we will attain salvation as Muslims, no two Muslims are the same. No two individuals worship the same God. No two people understand the Quran in the same way. No two people relate to the Prophet in the same way. No two people understand God in the same way. In our private worlds, it's a very different world. The same Allah I worship is not the Allah you are worshipping. The Allah you are worshipping is not the same Allah I am worshipping. The Allah I worshipped at the age of 20 is not the one I am worshipping today. He's a very different God to the one I worshipped 20 years ago. That God was worshipped through my selfish motivations, through my fear, through my insecurity. The one that I worship now is the one that I look forward to going and meeting. Is the one that I'm hopeful in through my own weaknesses and inability. It's a very different God that I worship today than the, worship, than the one I worshipped so many years ago. This is known as Relativity, which leads to plurality. The absolute norm is to accept these differences, to accept this beautiful plurality caused by relativity. And that affects every level of human existence, whether it's theology, whether it's sociology, whether it's economics, whether it's behavior, whatever it is. But the absolute standard is individuality and relativity. We need to appreciate that two people will not think the same. And when they find and form groups, those groups will have a group identity, which will be an individual identity, and they will think differently. The absolute norm is to embrace this variety. And we will talk about plurality and uniformity, as I keep on saying. But for today only, Individuality yields relativity and plurality. The absolute world is the world of the greater Islam. Now, Hick talks about religions as pre-axial, axial, and post-axial. 
pre-axial, he says they are exclusivist. They all have claims of salvation strictly to themselves. Axial are those that talk about inclusivism. They say that our religion includes the truth of your religion to a lesser level. And post-axial, he says, is pluralism. Now, I disagree with that. It's pluralism, and I will, I will explain pluralism. As I said, we'll get to it. What I feel is no. The true state of Islam is an inclusive state, but does not include other faiths. It includes Islam as well. Because the true state of Islam is not this formalistic religion that we have. It is a state that accommodates this formalistic religion that we have in the name of Islam, as well as other formalistic religions. The way to understand it is that we have a shop of religion. We have packaged religions, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, we also have Islam in there as a packaged religion. But the true human state is human Islam that the Quran talks about as one religion. And that is the whole shop of religion itself. And that is the whole outlook towards religion. If we can understand this, then this will be the religion of Al-Mahdi. That will be the broad religion of Al-Mahdi. And when we conclude, we will come back to this point and say how he will create and establish his religion. But if we can understand this today, then we can actually go towards the making of that religion. And I'm not talking about introducing a new religion, but I'm talking about expanding into that religion. I've never been as cautious as I am in this community anywhere. <laughs> Salawat. <laughs> you know, when you drove from your houses to here, I guarantee you don't remember the road. You have no recollection of the road, do you? Of how many cars that were there, how many times you swore at the traffic lights because they were red and you were getting late. It always happens. Whenever we're late, the traffic lights are red. You don't remember any of those things. When I switch myself on, I don't remember what I'm saying. It's auto mode. I just keep on talking. This is the one community that actually forces me to think, consider what you're saying. You know. So bless you all for bringing that about in me, at least. So here now, we have individuality. This individuality brings in variety and relativity. Relativity at every level. Imagine if there is relativity at the level of relation to God, then obviously there will be relativity that will permeate the cross-section of human endeavors. There will be relativity of appreciation of truth. So some will say Christianity is the truth. Others will say Judaism is the truth. Others will say Islam, the formalistic Islam, is the truth. And then within Islam, some will say Sunni Islam is the truth. Some will say Shia Islam is the truth. Some will say Barelwi. Some will say Diobandi, so on and so forth. This is not a disease within humankind. This is the natural, absolutely beautiful condition with which human beings ought to exist. This is the absolute standard. It can't be otherwise. How can Mahdi come and get rid of this? What is so natural within existence? Will he come and modify all your faces to look like me? Might not be a bad idea. <laughs> can you actually allow your Mahdi to come and rid this world of plurality, of relativity of the truth? Make everybody look the same, speak the same, gesticulate in the same way. Imagine how boring the world would be. I mean, there would be no high street shops. No manicure, no pedicure, everybody looks the same. Imagine, that world will not be worthy of living. We will go to the plastic surgeons and say, actually make my nose crooked so I stand out. <coughs> if variety was taken away, human being will go and create variety. Because we can't exist outside variety. What would be the point of me talking to you? You'd be talking to me. We'd all be talking to each other in the same tone, in the same language, or in the same thought. We will all be thinking the same. Can you imagine the world will become a hellhole? Everybody will start with thinking the same way. It would be the most boring world ever. I'm sorry if I'm making it ridiculously stupid, but is the message getting across. But isn't this our thought of Mahdi? That everybody becomes the same. 
everybody becomes a Muslim, all praying the same direction, all with their arms open, all doing kunud. Isn't this our thought of Al Mahdi? Isn't this the way we understand Mahdi? That there will be nothing but uniformity and similarity. This is the most naive notion ever. The best thing is to appreciate this individuality and variety. And through that say, the actual norm ought to be appreciation of variety. Once we say yes, we can appreciate variety, we can appreciate relativity, then we can go on and talk about plurality and a binding force within plurality. But we can't make that move until we appreciate first and foremost that variety is a natural part of human existence. <coughs> now tell me, the wisdom in Quran being so ambiguous, why is the Quran ambiguous? In order to allow for the flow of this variety. Think about this. The Quran says, and wash your arms till your elbows. It leaves it ambiguous. Because it knows that the hallmark of human existence is variety, individuality, relativity, and variety of interpretation. And it actually condones that variety. Look at the Quran. It, you know, we are very naive. We will say, for example, Shura is the befitting political theory within Islam. Because Allah says, وَأَمْرَهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ Shura. Yes? Quran condones that. And then in Iran we say Wilayat al faqih is the befitting political system. The Quran condones that as well. Ati Allah wa Rasulullah minkum. Somebody says monarchy is the most befitting system. The Quran condones that as well. With Sulaiman and Bilqis. Somebody else says international democracy. Quran condones that as well. What is with this Quran? It's contradicting itself. It's not contradicting itself. It is appealing to variety and relativity. Look at the beauty of the Quran. You say this, it will say yes. You say that, it will say yes. The failure of the Muslim mind is that it wants uniformity in singularity. There is uniformity in variety if only we could discover it. The Mu'tazilite theologian said what? We have freedom of will. Yes? And we take responsibility for actions. The Quran says yes. You are responsible. The Ashairah said no. The creation is God's. The existence is God's. The action is God. The Quran says, yes, you're right. Quran is condoning two conflicting positions. To a naive mind, the Quran is conflicting two conflicting positions. Within the Quran, it is not. The Quran is condoning variety, relativity, in a greater binding unity, which we need to discover. But we can only discover that after we appreciate variety, relativity, and plurality. Only after that can we appreciate it. But the Muslims haven't taken those simple steps to get there. It is due to this naivety. So I say, if we let the Fatih works for Iran, for let it be. But international democracy is no less godly than Wilayat the Fatih. Shura is no less ordained by the Quran than Wilayat the Fatih. All of these are truths in the scope of individuality and variety so long as they work. Work in what? We go back to yesterday's principle in the evolutionary growth. But I said there are a few components of this thought that we need to work on in the next one or two days that we have left. So this is the message of variety. Look everywhere. Open our minds. Look everywhere. Look anywhere. We will find nothing but individuality, variety, relativity, plurality across the section of human endeavors, just as existence is. Existence is individualistic, human being is individual, and that individuality produces variety and relativity. The attitude towards it should be a very positive attitude. The Quran is phenomenal in the way it's understood things. It's phenomenal in the way it conveys things. We need to understand that. It appreciates variety. It condones variety. To a naive mind, it is condoning conflicting, uh, opposing and conflicting positions. It's not. It is condoning truth of variety where it works. And it's talking about a binding unity between all of them. I expressed that we normally say our Imams are the same. 
they are not the same. They are very different. Their personalities are different. Their methods of thinking, their ways of thinking are different. The course of action they take is very different. I just explain this, and as I said, we want to extensively talk about Hazrat Abbas on this night. When Muawiyah sat on the pulpit, after the truce, he tore, yes, the letter of the, the, the treaty of truce. He tore it up. Imam Hussein was enraged. He stood up and he drew his sword. Al Hassan said to him, No. Sit down and calm yourself. Now this is not the only time we find this difference. Again and again we find this difference between Imam Hassan and Imam Al Hussein. They were different personalities. Both of them were beautifully, equally depicting the face of God. Equally. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have one name Allah. Does he? he is Rahman. He is Rahim. He is Kareem. He is Muntaqim. All the beautiful names are names of Allah. He himself has infused this world with variety. Each one of them are bearing his name in their own glorious way. There is nothing but differences. There is nothing but differences. The attitude should be to accept difference. And then to appreciate difference. And then to make that other move that we are going to talk about. How differences constitute to the growth of human race. What we talk about today. A person whose love. A person whose love flows within our veins. <coughs> Together with Hussein, Abbas's love is fed to us within the laps of our mothers, within the cradles in which we are rocked. Every lullaby talks of Hussein and of Abbas. He is such a hero that truly grabs our hearts, who is a pulse of our existence. <coughs> And no matter how much love and devotion we give to this man, is less than what he deserves. Fazil Darbandi reports, he said, I had a dream that I was between the haram of Al Hussein and Abbas. And the illustrious lady appears. I saluted her and she remained silent. I fell at her feet and I said, Oh Fatima, have I disappointed you in any way? She said, you do not visit my son. I said, I go to your Hussein three times a day. She said, you visit Hussein often, but you do not visit my Abbas as often. A Sadiq says, Kana ammi al-Abbas sulb al-Iman nafid al-Basira. My uncle Abbas was staunch in faith and had penetrative insight. He was not only a man who was gallant warrior and a mountain of strength and bravery, he was a man of substance. He was an alim, a qari, a faqih, a person who was known for his wisdom. But that particular quality prevailed and that is what is marked by. And Imam Sadiq says, Abbas has a rank with Allah on the day of Qiyamah that will precede and supersede every rank of the Shuhada. The scene is depicted that on the day of Qiyamah people will look towards the great throne of Allah and they will see brilliant lights at the summit of the throne. In envy they will say, who are these? And it will be told to them, and these are the companions of Hussein on the day of Ashura. And then they will see the most brilliant light at the helm of all lights. And they will say, who is this? And it will be told, this is Abbas. And the way Imam Sadiq describes him, and these are his words, Kal Jabalil Azim. He was like a lofty mountain. Wa qalbahu katawdil jaseem with a momentous heart. He was a champion swordsman. A fearless warrior. 
وَكَانَ جَسُورًا عَلَى الطَّعْنِ وَضَرْبِ فِي مَيْدَانِ الْكُفَّارِ وَالْحَرْبِ And he was audacious to receive wounds in the battlefield against the swords and the spears. And we hear that when Abbas used to ascend his steed, his soles of his feet would touch the ground. This is how lofty his stature used to be. Fazil Bahrul Ulum was called in to oversee the repairs that needed to be made to the grave of Abbas. And he took with him a builder, a carpenter, or a, or, or a plasterer. And that man observed the grave of Abbas. And he said, O Sayyid, if it is not audacious, may I pose a question to you? He said, indeed. He said, don't you say in your narrations that Abbas's stature was such that when he sat on his steed, the soles of his feet touched the ground. He said, indeed he was. He said, then why is his grave so small? Bahrul struck his head against the grave of Abbas and he said, Wa Abbasa, Atta'uhu irban irba. They cut him into pieces. It wasn't Abbas who descended the horse. It was the pieces of Abbas that descended upon the earth of Karbala. His titles, Abu al-Fadl, the father of Fadl, Abu al-Qirba, the father of the water skin, Amar bani Hashim, the radiant moon of the Hashimis, Abdul Salih, the righteous servant, Al Muasi, the consoler, Al Fadi, the one who sacrificed himself, Al Hami, the protector, Al Waqi, the savior, Al Da'i, the one who called upon the truth, Bab Al Hawaij, the door for the granting of supplications, Hamil Al Liwa, the bearer of the standard, Al Sakka, the quencher of thirst. We will talk about a few of these designations. Imam Ali, when he wanted to marry, he said to Aqil, find me a woman from a brave warrior household that she can give me a child who will depict the strength of the Hashimis. When Abbas was born, this is what I have read from the books, Ali carries him into his hands and kisses his arms and cries out. They say, why do you kiss his arm and why do you cry? He said, by Allah, you will have them cut in the love of his Hussein. Bashir comes to Medina. When Zainul Abidin comes back from Karbala and camps outside Medina, he comes to Medina and says, Ya Ahla Yathraba, La Muqama Lakum Biha, O people of Medina, there is no place left for you in Medina. Hussein has been killed in Karbala. And his son camps outside Medina awaiting you to greet him and to console him. An old woman came with the aid of a walking stick. She said, silent, O Bashir. Hussein cannot be killed. O maid of God, Hussein has been killed. Where was my Abbas? Your Abbas was killed. How can anybody kill my Abbas? They ambushed him and they cut his arms off. And then he was struck with an iron maze upon the back of his head. And then he was torn into pieces. And that is how Abbas was killed. She paused and she said, if his arms were cut, then how did he arrive upon the plains of Karbala? I will say, Umul Banin, if you wish to know, then come with me on the 11th of Muharram and see how Zainab, with her hands tied behind her back, arrives upon the body of Abba Abdullah. She said, indeed, Laukana Seifuka Beyadik, O Abbas, if your sword was in your hand, Ma dana minka min ahad. No one would have come anywhere near you. Abbas is Hamilul Liwa, the bearer of standard. Ali ibn Abi Talib describes the lofty position of the bearer of a standard. Ra'ya in the Romans was a standard under which an army of a thousand would gather. 
Imam Ali gives an eloquent khutbah in Najul Balagha. Let the best of you, the most staunch in faith, the bravest of you, the most God-fearing, the most resolved of you, bear the standard. For that is the morality, for that is the strength of the whole army. Once the standard falls, the army becomes demoralized. At the age of 25, Ali, after others bore the standard, bore the standard in Khaybar. And he killed his own opponent, and then he killed the opponent of Hamza and Jafar Tayyar. In Ohad, Mas'ab bin Umair carried the standard. When his arms were cut, Ali carried the standard. After 25 years, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya bore the standard at Nahrawan and Jamal and at Sifin. Now we come to Sifin. Ali ibn Abi Talib sits with his companions and says to his companions, Observe, observe the battle of my Hassan al Hussein. They looked at the battle of Al Hassan al Hussein and then they turned to Ali and they said, Oh Amirul Mu'mineen, if it is not audacious, may we say something? He said, speak. He said, Al Hassan fights gallantly. But Al Hussein, there is a person that is masked that follows him and does not allow anyone to reach near your Hussein and puts them to death. And he said, That is my Abbas, the brother of Hussein. They said, Ali, why do you not let Hassan and Hussein advance in the battlefield? Why is it always Abbas and Muhammad ibn Hanafiya? He said, Hassan and Hussein are the children of Muhammad. These are my children. Al Hassan and Hussein are my eyes. Abbas and Hanafiya, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, are my hands. And the hands protect the eyes. Now, the way in which Ali used to fight single combat was such that nobody would be ready to oppose Ali in the battle. They would all engage mutually in Sifin because it was a very long battle, very long war, almost a year long. So from time to time, in accordance with Arab traditions, they would break and they would go for single battle. Abu Ash'az, Abu Sha'za, came into the battlefield and called for his equal. Now, before that, the way Ali ibn Abi Talib used to fight his battle was that he would ride up to his foe and with utmost ease dissect them, put them to death. The art of battle, if you want to see how Ali fought, read some of the descriptions that Sayyid Radhi gives of the way in which Ali used to turn on his saddle and turn his blade, and how people around him would just drop dead. This is how Ali used to conduct his battle, with utmost ease. Now Abu Shasa came inside the battlefield, a raging lion, a warrior, counted amongst the topmost warriors. He called for his equal. Somebody came into the battlefield with a face mask, rode up to Abu Shahza, and effortlessly beheaded him. There was a cry in the forces of Muawiyah, this is Ali beneath the face mask, do not approach him. Do not go near him. And as there was this commotion within the people of Sham, Ali ibn Abi Talib rode up from behind. He came next to the swordsman, the horse rider, and he placed his hand upon his face. And as he began to extract his face mask, the historians quote, it was as if the brilliant moon was appearing from behind black clouds that were separating and disappearing. And he said, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib, wa hadha qamar bani Hashim Abbas. And that is where he gets this designation, Kamar Bani Hashim, the brilliant moon of the Hashimis. Abbas at that point was only 17. At Karbala, Abbas bore the standard of Hussein. When the spoils of war were brought in with the captives in the court of Yazid, the historian describes. Yazid sat upon his throne. He looked at something and stood in awe, then sat down again. His glances fell again at what he looked at. He stood again and then he sat down. The third time when he stood in awe, 
He said, whose standard is that? There is not a single place on that standard, but that it has received a blow from a spear or a sword or from an arrow that's pierced it apart from the place where it was held. He was told this is the standard of Abbas. It did not fall but with the cutting of the hand of Abbas. Yazid said, Wallahi Abbas, laqad abayt al-la'an. By Allah Abbas, you refuse submission. This is the way in which a brother defends a brother. The strength of Abbas and the lofty stature of Abbas. On the day of Ashura, we are told, Shimmer did not smile. But when there was uproar at the banks of the Euphrates on the al qama Shimar asked, what has happened? He was told, Abbas has fallen. He broke into a smile. And he said, now Hussein cannot escape. And it was at that point Hussein said, Alan in kasara vahri wa qallat hilati. Now my back has broken. And now my means have become devastated. But Abbas's real strength is Abbas's inner strength. Imagine, if you are known, if you are known for your strength, if that is deprived from you, how broken you would become. We know for a fact when we hear the Zakirin that when Zainab used to be told that there will come a time that your chowder will be extracted from your head, she would be bewildered and think, will Abbas not be there? When Sakina used to be told, you will thirst, she would think, with an uncle like Abbas? This is how he is known for his strength. Imagine if such a man's strength is deprived from him, how he ought to break. He comes out of the Euphrates, he's ambushed, his right arm is cut. Imagine the pain. But Abbas cries out, Wallah, law qata'atum yameeni, by Allah, even if you cut my right arm, inni abadan wuhami andini, I will not cease to defend my faith. Wa an imam min sadiq al yaqini, and my imam who is a truthful imam. They cut his right arm off, left arm off. He says, Ya nafsu, la takhsha al-kuffar. O soul, do not have any fear of the kuffar. Qad qata'u bi maghiyihim yasari. They have cut my left, left arm off. A person does not think of that excruciating pain, the physical, nor the psychological, but calls out in rage. But the true strength of Abbas and look at this. This is his control and his character. He enters into the door of Walid and Marwan. The lion of Ali is raging. His eyes are pouring with tears. He's grinding his teeth. He is about to behead them. And Hussein places his hand upon the chest of Allah. And says, Oh brother, calm your soul. And Abbas contains himself. Then again, we see him on the 7th of Muharram. When Amr ibn Sa'ad says, Remove your tents from Al Qama, he says, How dare anybody <laughs> say anything to my brother and ask us to remove our tents? Who oh, says, Abbas, do as they say. He is defiant. We hear from Abu Zakirin, Hussein turns to Zainab, call upon your Abbas. We find a description. He is crying and sobbing as he is unpegging the tents. And his strength. On the morning of Ashura, he is guarding the rear of the tent, fearing an ambush. Zuhair came, comes to Abbas. He says, oh Abbas! Do you know why your father had asked for you from Allah? He paused. He said, Zuhair, it's a sensitive time. It is not a moment to talk. 
But since you have mentioned my father in reverence, I pause. Tell me. He said, your father besieged you. Your father begged Allah to give you to him for this day. When he heard that in a rage, Abbas placed his feet in the stirrup that the stirrup broke. He said, Zuhair, do you wish to incite me? Watch what I show you. At that point, somebody spoke to Hussein in an audacious manner. And Imam Hussein had had a trench dug at the back of the tents in order to stop the people from ambushing and had it filled with wood and reed and had it set alight. He said, oh Hussein, do you want to fall into the pit of hell before we drive you into the pit of hell? Abbas went behind that wall, behind that man. He killed 80 people, extracted the spear of that man and with the left hand beheaded that man with his own spear. He came back and he said to Zuhair, Zuhair, do not incite me again. Such was the strength of Abbas, and his character was even beyond. Abbas is called Babul Hawaij. Imam Sadiq says, May Allah have mercy on my uncle Abbas, the son of Ali. He preferred his brother above his own self. He sacrificed himself for his brother and gave his arms in the way of his brother. Allah changed his arms with two wings. And he takes flight in paradise together with Ja'far al Tayyar. Now we have this incident with Sheikh Hussein. He's an Iranian. He states he was he was crippled. He suffered a stroke. So what he would do would that be that he would drag himself to the mosque and he would drag himself to the pulpit and sit there. He narrates. On the night of the Shahada of Abbas Salamullah he went to the pulpit and he momentarily dozed off. After a little while, he saw a man ascended upon a horse. And the man said, Hussein, stand up and do matam for Abbas. He said, but I can't stand up. He said, I'm telling you to stand up. He said, in that case, extend your hand to me. He said, I have no hands. Take hold of the rein of my horse and stand up. He stands and finds himself standing. And then we have a, an incident from the time of Sheikh Ansari. There was a student, a poor Iranian student, who went to Najaf to study, but due to his circumstances and poverty, could not continue with his studies. So he said, I shall go and bid farewell to Imam Hussein and Abbas. Then I shall come back to Najaf and go back to Iran. But secretly he desired to purchase a house next to the shrine of Imam Ali and wanted to study for 10 years and was a particular budget in his mind. So he went to Imam Hussein and he bid him farewell. Then he came to Abbas and as he was bidding farewell to Abbas, he saw a Bedouin woman rush inside the shrine. She grabbed hold of the shrine of Abbas and audaciously taunted Abbas. And she said, how dare my son goes missing in Karbala when I am your guest. As she was taunting Abbas and furying at Abbas, people came running and they said, oh, maid of God, stop. We found your child. So he thought to himself, he said, Abbas, you're an Arab, aren't you? And of course you look after your own. I am not one of you. With a disappointment he left. When he went to Najaf, Sheikh Ansari summoned him into his office. It's documented. He said, I have given you that house. And I am giving you X amount of money to sustain 10 years of studies. He was baffled. He said, how did you know this? He said, don't undermine Abbas in that. And look at the stature of Abbas. You know, when we go for the ziyarah of Hussein Salamullah, there are 150 martyrs with Hussein. Yes? But what do we do? In reverence, we do the ziyarah of Hussein, don't we? And we pray two rakat salah for Imam Hussein, don't we? And not for anybody else. Not for Hazrat Ali Akbar, not for Hazrat Ali Azgar, not for any of the shahada. Why? 
because when the sun is there, the stars disappear. This is the stature of Hussein ibn Ali. But look at the way Allah has honored Abbas. That we do the ziyara of Hussein, and this is the practice of Imam Salih, and we walk to the shrine of Abbas. And we do his dukhul once again. And as taught by Imam Sadiq, we do not salute Abbas like we salute Hussein from one direction. We salute Abbas from four different directions. And we pray to Rakat Salah there. This is how he is honored. Until this day, the same al that Abbas was unable to take back to his Sakina flows at his feet and kisses his feet. And we understand that they are baffled as to how it takes this root and kisses the feet of Abbas and flows onwards. And look at the lofty stature of Abbas. The lofty stature of Abbas. We hear that on the 13th, miraculously, Zainul Abidin Salamullah appears in Karbala. The people of Bani Asad were there and he asks assistance of them to bury the dead. They could not identify the headless bodies. So Imam Zil al-Abidin asks for a straw mat. On the straw mat, he places the body of his father, Imam Hussein, lays him to rest, and on the chest of Imam Hussein, he places Ali Asr. <coughs> At the feet of Imam Hussein, he places Ali Akbar. Next to Imam Hussein, all the other martyrs are placed. The people of Bani Asad come to Zainul Abidin and they say there is a body at al qama that refuses to move. When we pick it from its chest, its feet become pinned to the ground. When we lift its legs, its back becomes pinned to the ground. He said, he will not come to me. I will have to go to him. When Zainul Abidin walks to him, and sees Abbas's body, he falls, he says, Wa Abbas, Wa Abbas. Oh Abbas, by your going away, the heavens have become illuminated and the earth has become a darkened place. Oh Abbas, if only you heard the pleas of your Zainab and Kulsum when they were being struck upon their backs with whips. Oh Abbas, if only you saw what I saw, how your sisters were tied with ropes. And he buries Abbas there. And he said, this is an honor reserved by Abbas that a masum imam has buried him. These are the final moments of Karbala. Nobody is left. Abbas comes to Hussein and he says, oh brother, allow me to give my life for you. For I cannot withstand this destitution that I see. I cannot withstand the state of yours. Hussein looks deep into the eyes of Abbas. And he says, Benafsi anta ya Abbas. My life be sacrificed for you, O Abbas. If you go away now, my forces will become demoralized. He said, O oh brother, what forces? It is only me and it is only you. And it is only the women left now. But Hussein was hesitant to give away his Abbas. There is a hadith from the seventh Imam that when Imam Hussein made way for his final battle, there was an ilham upon his heart. And he was told, Look towards the heavens. When he looked, it was filled with angels. Allah said, Take aid of these angels and destroy your enemies. The seventh Imam says, Tears roll down Hussein's eyes. And he said, Oh Allah, they have taken away my Abbas from me. Hussein looks at Abbas and says, Oh Abbas, how can I let you go? There was a cry from the tents. Oh Abbas, look, a child might have died due to thirst. Abbas goes inside the tents. And what does he find? The place where they keep the water skins. There are children there and Sakina is with them. And due to excessive thirst, these children are rubbing the water skins against their stomachs so that the coolness of the water skins may relieve them of some thirst. 
Abbas takes the water skins and says, Oh children, fear not, I shall bring back some water for you. He comes out and he says, Oh brother, they are dying of thirst. Allow me to bring water for them. Husayna said, Oh Abbas, go in the way of Allah and bring back water for them. This is what happens. Abbas kisses Imam Hussein on his forehead, <coughs> ascends his steed, looks towards the sky, and says, Oh Allah, do not disappoint Abbas. Allow Abbas to bring back some water for these children. Abbas sets off. From afar, Hussein awaits. He hears nothing from Abbas. Then he sees the standard of Abbas emerging. After a point he sees the standard falling. Hussein sits down. Ah! He sees the standard rising once again. Hussein is filled with some hope. When the standard drops the second time, Hussein looks on. He does not find the standard rise again. He grabs his back and cries out, Al-Alan, in kasara dhahri wa qallat hilati. My back has been broken now. He hears a commotion and does not see the standard once again. He ascends Zul Janal. Oh, faithful steed, take me to my brother. Bahrul Ulum says, Hussein cries out, Oh, Abbas, call on to me, for I do not see anything. Zuljana stops. Barul Ulum stays. Oh horse, have you found my brother? Hussein descends from the horse and he says, Zuljana, my Abbas is not here. And there he finds the severed arm of Abbas. He carries the arm and says, Wa Abbasa. What happened was Abbas's arm was cut. Abbas carried the water skin with his teeth. When it was punctured, Abbas stopped and from the place where his arms were cut to the place where his shrine is, they surrounded him and struck him continuously until finally he fell from his steed. Hussein calls out, Oh Abbas, call on to me. There is no response. Finally Hussein finds his lion. He comes, sits next to Abbas. He lifts Abbas's head and puts it into his lap. As he does this, Abbas moves his head away. Hussein finds this strange. Abbas is saying something. Hussein draws near to Abbas. Abbas is saying, Oh man, wait for a moment before you behead me. Let me behold my brother for one last time. Hussein says, Oh Abbas, it is I, your Hussein. He said, Oh brother, forgive me. There is an arrow in one eye and wound fields another. Hussein carries the head of Abbas, clasped it to his chest and cries out aloud. And as Hussein cries, the enemy break into tears and their horses begin to cry. And Hussein says, you cry now? After killing my Abbas? After depriving of my life? After breaking my back? Hussein observes that Abbas has become tearful and crying. Hussein says, Oh Abbas, what brings grief to your heart at this point? Abbas says, Oh Hussein, how may I not cry when I see you lifting my head from the dust, cleansing my face of wound, and I know very soon after me you will be brutally beheaded and there will be no one to raise your head from the dust. I will say, Oh Abbas, such consideration for your Hussein, even at this point? Hussein says, Oh Abbas, do you have any final request? He says, Oh brother, do not take me back to the tents. Why, oh brother? Your Zainab expects you. I feel embarrassment from your Sakina, oh Hussein. I had promised to bring her water, and I have not done so. And if Zainab sees me in this state, her patience will give way. Hussein, leave me. Abbas is fading away. Hussein tries to lift Abbas. 
is all proxy size. He says, oh, brother, what is it that you do? Oh, Abbas, I must take you back. He said, Hussein, I beseech you for the sake of Allah, let me be. He says this and breathes his last. Hussein is devastated. He carries the alam of Abbas on the back of his team, makes way towards the tent. This is the maktab. Sakina sees the standard of Abbas. She runs to receive Abbas with a group of children. And behind them is Sakina. She sees Hussein. And she says, Oh Father, do you have any news of my uncle Abbas? He lies slain, O oh child, at the banks of the Euphrates. Zainab comes after him. Oh Hussein, why did you not bring my Abbas back to me? Oh sister, he was torn to an extent that I could not lift him. When he said that, she slapped her face and she said, Wa Abbasa, wa akha, wa killata nasara, wa dayata ba'dak. Ma'atama, say.